Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's great to be with you all again for another edition of our program. Happy Wednesday, everybody. You've made it to the middle of the week, to the middle of the day of the middle of the week, where it's time we're going to take a little bit of a break. We're going to reset our brains. We're going to meet some interesting people who talk about interesting things. We're probably going to learn something new today, and then we will be energized and ready to get back out there and do the good work that we do. My name is Chris Smith. I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I am your host for the program most Wednesdays at noon. And the Lunchtime Discovery Series is organized by the folks with the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Them plus us makes a great team to bring you just great programs all of the time. Every single time we gather here for this program, we have a great time meeting our guest speakers, learning and hearing from them, their experiences and insights. Today's going to be no different. Now, today is the first day of March. And for the month of March, we here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series will be celebrating Women's History Month. And to do that, we are going to be meeting fabulous women who are out there in North Carolina achieving great things. Let me introduce today's Guest speaker, the one kicking off Women's History Month for us is Liani Yurka. Liani used to be on the team here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, so it has been fabulous to get to reconnect with Liani here before the show. But now Liani works as the Education Program Coordinator for the Sarah P. Duke Gardens, not too far away up in Durham, North Carolina. Hi, Liani. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you. It's great to see the museum in the background and um, meet some meet, meet some new friends and see some old friends. It's great. Thanks for having me. And so when you were here at the museum, you worked in accessibility and inclusion. I did. Uh, you did similar work, I think, for North Carolina Wildlife. I don't want to mm-hmm. preempt your presentation. I hope no. not. No, you're good. Uh, <laughs> and now as program coordinator at Duke Gardens, it looks like you've got your hands full. Uh, I have a wonderful opportunity, yeah, to keep educating and exploring the natural world with people however they feel comfortable or are able to, yeah. So. Well, very excited to hear about the work that you're doing there and see what's going on. So mm-hmm. I will turn the program over to you. Great. I'm going to share my screen so everybody can see what I'm going to show. Let's see. All right. All right. So um, thank you for that great introduction, Chris. I'm Liana Yurka. I'm the Education Program Coordinator for Sarah P. Duke Gardens. Um, it's great to be here, and um, I hope that this is at least a little informative for some people um, and inspiring in some ways, um, get you through the midweek hop, at least. Um, so I've been at Sarah P. Duke Gardens since September of 2022. Sarah P. Duke Gardens, or Duke Gardens as we're known most commonly, is about a 55-acre living plant museum, which is great for my background and um, last roles in museum settings. Uh, we are on the ancestral territories of Eno, Okanichi, Saponi, Shikori, Atchishir, and Tutelo peoples, and it's in the heart of Duke University's campus. Um, I've been really lucky to be here for a few months now, and I'm even luckier to have a really rich background and career opportunities. So Chris mentioned um, my time at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Um, When I left the museum, I went to work for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission um, as their diversity outreach specialist, helping engage diverse communities on public lands. And then I transitioned to working for the city of Raleigh at Walnut Creek Wetland Park um, in Southeast Raleigh, um, where I was able to reach a diverse array of visitors to a really cool wetland habitat, um, which is really great. I also graduated from North Carolina State University, not once, but twice. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in zoology from NC State and um, a applied ecology master's degree um, from NC State a few years later. Um, I'm always really humbled to present to a group of colleagues and peers. Here's a little bit of like photo history about me. Um, And I'm going to be really excited to talk more about just my career path and how that has led to doing a lot of inclusion and accessibility work throughout my career and continued 
said today. Um, so really, my career has been focused on environmental education with a focus on um, like a sub focus on really removing barriers for people to access nature and to access science. Um, people in communities that may be marginalized or historically have had a more challenging time getting into the outdoors or facing barriers and getting in the outdoors. So my drive is to say everybody can enjoy the outdoor spaces or the natural world around us um, if we just kind of make that world more accessible to them. So a little bit more about me, um, which is foundational to kind of where I am today. Um, the first thing is I never wanted to be an educator. <laughs> um, here I am as an environmental educator. I did really, really well in like public school settings. I, um, you know, did fine in um, middle school, high school, but I really didn't love going to school. I had a lot of challenges in the social settings of school, um, but I got good grades and I studied hard. I just didn't find my niche or like my drive or my passion there. I really wanted to become a veterinarian. I wanted to work with wildlife or marine mammals, um, but I just didn't uh, want to be, a, just didn't want to be a teacher, didn't think about that. Um, as a teenager, I started volunteering at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and um, allowed myself to meet teens and other kids who were kind of like me. Um, so the museum has a really wonderful program for teen volunteers. And at the time I joined the junior curator program and um, I was able to meet kids who knew what going on a hike meant um, and it wasn't looked upon as being weird. So that was really great. Um, the junior curator gave him the opportunity to go into the museum every week and feed captive wild animals that are used as their educational program ambassadors. Um, I remember going home and telling my parents stories of holding an alligator or cleaning up snake poop or picking up turtles. And um, my parents have always been very, very supportive, but they, they were not um, nature-y kind of people at that time. So they were slightly horrified. Um, that I was enjoying doing that, but we're again, very glad that I was able to do that with those students, uh, with those classmates of mine. So um, as a junior curator, I fed that passion and found what felt like my second home. Um, I found some of my closest friends. I found who would later be my husband, who is in these pictures in various places and um, continued after graduating high school as a volunteer at the museum um, through college and um, and beyond, really. The museum at the time, after I graduated high school, was looking for someone who could provide Spanish language programming, um, educational programming to what was then a pretty small but growing Hispanic Latino community in North Carolina. Um, the request came to me from um, this wonderful woman in the top right hand corner with the great red hair. Her name is Ginger. Um, and Ginger asked if I could go read storybooks to children in Spanish at some local libraries. And um, it was probably a really good thing that she didn't ask me to be a teacher or an educator because uh, I probably would have walked away. But my recollection at that time was someone was going to pay me to handle animals and I at the, also at the time had a much younger sister. She was like five. So I knew how to read storybooks and to children in Spanish. It was great. Um, and Spanish was my is my first language. So it worked out really well. I was like, sure, I'll read books to kids and I get paid to do that. Um, so it worked out really well. I think I was, you know, early in college thought, sure, why not? Um, so one thing led to another and time went on and I remained in the, the museum in a few different capacities. Um, I contracted as a freelance bilingual educator for a while, uh, helping the, the museum who had a few grants. And then um, that just really led to me doing more and more educational programs for various different audiences. Um, I was working on grant funded positions. I was really teaching mostly in Spanish, some bilingually and across a diverse topic of science themes. Um, I remember teaching about dinosaurs. I remember teaching about venomous snakes. 
birds, um, a whole lot more. And it really provided me a like low cost opportunity to decide how I was going to become an educator. If I was going to be become an educator, um, it gave me the opportunity to realize that people across identities really enjoy science, but some people wouldn't be able to enjoy it fully if it wasn't being brought to them in a way in a package that was digestible or accessible for them. So it was really um, an opportunity for me to see how I could provide the entry to the natural world for some communities. Um, so through that time at the museum, I had graduated high school, I was in college, um, I fell in love, which is great. Um, my husband is in the lower right hand picture there during a museum Halloween event many, many years ago. Um, we got engaged while I was at the museum and I, some of my closest friends are in these pictures in their own weddings or in reunions um, through the junior curator program. So the museum really gave me my first steps as an environmental and informal educator. Um, and I would really love to say that I never looked back um, because that would be a great story. It would be a very short presentation this morning, but that's not that's not how it went. I was still in college and um, I really wanted to go to vet school um, and I wanted to work with wildlife and I wanted to be outdoors. And um, I really didn't enjoy public school and I thought educators weren't what I want. I didn't want, want to be the type of educator that I had experienced in school. Um, so really it was serendipity that I met the right people and started to grow roots both at the museum and in Raleigh in a way that kept me involved at the museum and in the environmental education world. And, um, and really that's what I did. So instead of applying to vet school, I got a full-time job at a nearby local government in Wake County, um, doing environmental education in, um, in schools, really about recycling and solid waste and composting, um, which was a, a really great first permanent job as a very young seedling adult. Um, it was not my dream job, but what it did teach me was that um, I was a really resilient educator and that I could get people excited about the natural world, regardless of the setting that I was in. Um, so at that time, I was working on teaching school kids about the landfill and solid waste and the importance of appropriate recycling and all of this, and um, realized that our landfill was built um, in a way that required a stream to be remediated or remedied for the impacts of construction. And part of that remediation meant we had to do water quality testing anyways to make sure that the water quality was appropriate. So I was like, well... Like, why don't I just bring high schoolers out here and we can like do that as a class and be outside and get water quality samples. So it worked out really well that I was able to create a program in the setting that I had to be in about something that I cared about. Um, Cause I really, I saw a stream and I was like, I'm going to jump in and see what's living in there. I want to find a salamander or a crayfish and just explore the world. And um, sure enough, kids want to do that too. Um, so that is what we we did. And so that resilience in that first time, that first position for me really showed me how to teach about nature regardless of where I was. Um, so eventually, a full-time job did open up at the museum and I was able to apply. Um, it was a really perfect fit for me because it happened to be the position of the person who I had been working for when I was working part-time on some grants. Um, so when they left, I really, really wanted their job. I had seen what they were doing, working with diverse communities across North Carolina, and I um, put all my eggs in that basket and really wanted to come back. I was very excited about that position and reflecting on it, I was like, that is really the first time that I was like, I wanted to be an educator. I wanted to be able to provide science education for people. Um, and I really wanted to do it with communities that had been facing those barriers. Um, so um, those communities that might have been marginalized, who didn't have full access 
at the time, that was a bunch of different types of communities that weren't receiving environmental education the way um, maybe most classroom students or most public parks were able to offer it. So that included seniors who were um, in senior homes or in rehabilitative care. It included um, youth who were incarcerated or in um, alternative programs to school because of um, poor decision making. We were able to go into juvenile detention centers, um, again, teaching um, bilingual and Spanish language programming, and then especially focused on um, just communities of people who had different disabilities. So I worked a lot with people who were blind and visually impaired and people who were deaf or hard of hearing or had hearing loss. So working with those communities was really, really fulfilling. Um, here's my, oops, skip this part of the introduction. So I went to Apex High School and there's my NC State. Um, I did mention I graduated with a master's and that beautiful picture in the bottom is of me doing um, federally permitted work on the painted bunting as my master's research. Um, so good birds. So really the museum position launched me into this career of like why I do the work that I do and why I think many environmental educators do the work that we do. Um, we want to connect the natural world and people in some way and inspire people to appreciate or like or enjoy their time with or around the natural world. Um, and that that's really the crux of this presentation. So I've worked with um, the Governor Moorhead School for the Blind. I've used lots of different opportunities to engage people with different disabilities in what they're um, able to through programming, but also modifying programs in order for them to be really accessible and um, engaging to all audiences. So um, yeah, how do we go about this work and why do we go about this work? So when we are thinking about why people come to a, a place or why I do this work, I often am able to break that down into what feels like a really tangible kind of mathematical equation, um, because this is easy to present to donors or grantors or boards of directors or anybody who wants to um, ask you what you're doing and how much time you're spending doing that. Um, so you could work at any facility or site. Um, I've, you know, worked at museums, parks, um, game lands here at the Duke Gardens. Um, you can calculate the number of visitors that you receive at your site on a monthly or annual basis, whatever you want to do. This is a lot of math. So if you don't like math, just hold tight. It'll take a few seconds to get through this. And then we multi like divide that total number. Let's say you have a million visitors, divide a million by the percent of people that you in your community that faces a barrier for standard programming. Um, we can use people with disabilities because that's a pretty well documented number at this point. It's about 20% of the US. Um, in Wake County, where I was working for a long time, it's about 8% of the county that um, was living with a disability. And that that's a good number that we could could use. Um, so if you have 4,500 people come to your programs and 8% of them are with a disability, there's 360 people who might face a barrier to programming if you don't design your programs for people with disabilities to engage, or if you don't design your program universally. So that is a big mathematical why, right? That's why we do it. So I want everybody to be able to come to my programs and enjoy what I'm doing, but 8% of the people aren't going to be able to engage with what I'm doing if I don't build it in a way or program in a way that removes barriers. And 360 people, it might not feel like a lot unless you're in that 360 people and you want to enjoy programs, but you can't. Um, so you're you know, making a decision for people that they don't need the programs you're offering if you don't build it universally or provide a way for them to access it. Um, this balloons up for the larger institutions like big centers, big museums, big parks, um, national parks, wherever you are, your number of visitors increases. So that that percentage of the total number is going to be larger, right? Um, so this is a really easy why you can give to people of like, hey, I need $20,000 to make programming more accessible. Here's why. Um, 
You can do this with any number of demographics. It could be that you want to target the Latin or Hispanic or Latinx community. Um, that's where I started. And you can look at where in the country you are and where in the state you are and what percent of your population you're missing if your programs aren't designed to reach that community. Um, you can do this very basically using a many American community survey or census data. You can go really crazy and use programming software and make pretty colorful maps like the one I made in the bottom, um, depending on the data and how nerdy you are about math. Um, I love statistics, so I, I create these things, but I also want to talk about the story behind that, behind who it is. So the map was, the first one was Hispanic community or Spanish speaking community. We might have disability community. All of these numbers you can use to tabulate the why. And it can be any population depending on what you're wanting to focus on or how broadly or narrowly your scope could be. Um, but you can justify it in numbers very, pretty easily. And if you love numbers and have questions, I am here to answer them. Um, but the story behind those numbers are the people. Um, it's the the diversity that we all get to celebrate um, amongst ourselves and who may not be able to engage in what you're offering because the programs that you offer present a barrier. Um, so I, I think that the end result is not the numbers, it's the people. Um, but sometimes, you know, making decision makers want to see the rough estimate of the numbers. So the why is, like I said, it looks like a math equation, but really it's the human, the human element, which is harder to necessarily calculate, but also is a more authentic way to think about the why. So I'm going to make a few assumptions in this point in my presentation and assume that most of us who are here listening to this presentation are pretty hardworking, busy individuals, and we do a good job at the work that we do. And I also want to assume that each of us cares about the natural world and the world around us and the space that we live in, whether it's the planet that we're on on the global scale or your own backyard or your local park, we care about the space around us to some extent and the natural world to some extent. And I'm also going to make one more assumption and that is that at this point in our lives, we've each realized that um, not everybody is like, us, right? So not everybody I meet is like me, not everybody you meet is like you. There's this beautiful diversity of people, interests, and abilities. So we're going to embrace that we're all different, and we're going to embrace that we all care about the environment. And those are the assumptions I'm going to make today. But in that embracing and caring about the environment, we have to kind of remember that not everybody can do that or is able to do that in the same way financially, physically, emotionally. We are going to care about the environment in unique ways as we embrace that diversity. So some people might choose to walk outdoors together, as in this picture. Some people might choose to walk outdoor with their family or loved ones in quiet. But we're going to um, we're going to embrace how everybody experiences nature differently. So with that, I say, like, I've taken my entire career to say, like, time and nature should be a human right. Everybody should have the ability to get outdoors um, and enjoy the environment however they want to. Um, it shouldn't just be for people who are really well educated. It shouldn't just be for people who have a college degree or who can afford to only have one job or who can utilize all their senses fully. It's not just for those who are white or middle class, conservative or legal or any of those things. So that's my belief that nature and the outdoors is a human right to everybody. Um, sometimes me saying that can be construed as 
political and that's really not my intent. It's actually the exact opposite. I think nature is the most apolitical place we can all find ourselves in. And it took me a really long time to realize that I think that so fully that that's what I've made my whole career on so far. And that's what I'm working on is passing that message that everybody has a right to engage in the outdoors and we just have to meet them where they are. And I think nature is beautiful and therapeutic, rewarding in and of itself. And we know that nature has benefits to humans and people. It can help with cognitive function. It can help with emotional regulation. It can help with memory retention. Everybody should have access to that when they want it and how they want it. So based my career on that, um, here's some pictures throughout some of my time and I'll highlight a little bit about them. So um, on the left-hand side in the vertical image is a probably a middle school age, 10, 12, 13 year old, um, dressed in shorts and a light blue shirt holding what looks like a big TV antenna. Um, he's standing in the front of a group of other students of various ages. Um, what this group is doing is tracking a radio telemetry box turtle. So a box turtle at Prairie Ridge Eco Station that had a little radio transmitter attached to it. And the students were learning how scientists track box turtles in order to collect data about them and information about the population. It happens at this class with all students um, that were in an after school group of students with different learning differences and neurodivergence. So this was a group that maybe didn't get the full science club experience they normally would have if it wasn't for their teacher and I partnering to work on this program together. It was a really fun, it was a really fun group to work with over many, many, many weeks. Um, I really love that. In the upper right hand corner is a gentleman sitting in a suit and tie um, holding his white cane, which is an indicator of someone with vision loss or blindness. And in front of him is a younger person standing, also holding their cane. And they're um, immersed in some conversation. Um, in the background are other people milling about, just talking to one another. Uh, and so this was from the very first year that we hosted, the uh, museum hosted the STEM Career Showcase for Students with Disabilities, an event that I was able to start in my time at the museum that embraces and encourages students in middle and high school ages to come and learn and engage with professionals in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math who also have disabilities. So it's designed for students with disabilities or students with disabilities to engage with professional mentors also living with disabilities who are just rock stars in science, technology, engineering, or math. Um, in the bottom right hand is an image of a, of a child. On the right hand side, what appears to be their adult caregiver and another child next to them and some medical equipment in the foreground. I'm presenting a display case to the students. Um, this was at the UNC hospital where I was able to visit students who were in their juvenile oncology ward um, and weren't able to go to regular school or parks for their science education programming. So we were able to bring parts of the museum to them. Um, also at the museum, I was able to bring all staff trainings on inclusion and accessibility work, working with professionals and trainers and um, role models in the community. We were able to work with students who were in um, alternative programs to school who were getting their GED. That's in the top right where we took them birding. I remember that day particularly because there was a bald eagle flying over Prairie Ridge, which was really a great day for these students who'd never used binoculars to actually see a bald eagle fly overhead. Um, and similar programs um, with that same group in the bottom two pictures of working with those students on collecting data and understanding data literacy through their GED program. Um, these are more pictures from different years of the STEM Career Showcase for Students with Disabilities. Um, 
which was a really continues to be a great conference. And we were able to bring countless students to speak with really great mentors. Um, when I was at the museum, I really wanted to break down barriers for tours. And so we created um, with grant funding an accessible mobile app for iPhone users that provided complete description, audio descriptions of all of the exhibits and was usable by people and for people who were visually impaired or blind, um, which is a really fun process. Once I left the museum and I went to the Wildlife Resources Commission, I created um, many programs, but a really fun one was doing a Spanish language training for our wildlife enforcement officers or game wardens. Um, so game wardens often are the first uh, face of the Wildlife Commission for the public. They encounter people who are out hunting or fishing or just using game lands. And the, um, that division within Wildlife uh, Resources Commission really wanted to work on removing barriers when they engaged with uh, the public who spoke Spanish. So working with them, we created a like a nice training document that provided most of the question, like most of the interactions they initially have with constituents on game lands. I was able to translate those into Spanish and then I was able to give them like a phonetic pronunciation, which is a really interesting process because many, many of our officers work in remote parts of the state with um, areas that have really strong Southern accents, which I do not. And um, so it was interesting for me to phonetically translate how I say things in Spanish into how they might pronounce it using their vernacular. Um, and we were able to also do some marketing um, materials, which you see on the left that has um, officers in their wildlife officer uniforms. Um, it says guardabosque, which is the Spanish word for a game warden or a wildlife enforcement officer. So that was a really fun project across divisions where they asked for my support and we were able to do that. Um, we were also able to teach, I was able to teach the first um, voter safety courses that were in Spanish, which had never been done in the state of North Carolina before. So reaching people who need to know how to safely operate voting vessels, um, but doing that for Spanish, Spanish speaking audiences was really important, especially in um, different pockets of the state. So we were able to do that, which was really rewarding as well. Um, we created an access guide for sportsmen, um, people who go out on game ones are considered sportsmen. Um, so we created a guide for them for um, sportsmen with disabilities. So um, we had track chairs that were able to be used on all terrain areas. Um, yeah, and we wanted them to be able to give us their feedback. So we created a forum where they came out and talked to us about um, how they engage and use our game lines, um, which was really interesting to just talk to people who are out there, but facing their own barriers and let us let, it, let us kind of prioritize what we could do to support them. Here at Duke Gardens, I've only been here again since September, so not very long. But I um, have started a partnership with our local um, high school, Durham School of the Arts, who has an OCS uh, occupational course of study class for students in high school ages who um, have autism. And these students are coming to the gardens already every month. Um, they come when the weather is nice and help us by doing litter pickup and learning their own um, kind of skills in doing that, which helps with their motor skills, um, orientation and mobility skills, um, listening to directions. But every now and then they want to come under the gardens and the weather isn't nice or they want to do something a little bit different. So I'm working with their teachers and their um, instructors and we partner with them where once a month they're coming to the garden and engaging in an art and science lesson. That's a combination of bringing the nature and the art together for the students to work with their kind of hand-eye coordination, motor skills, um, again, listening to directions, following directions one at a time, pace by pace. Um, so they've been doing this with me since December. Um, in January, we did soil painting. So we used soil as the medium for paint and they each made um, 
their own artwork that they were able to take to class, back to school or home. It was right before Valentine's Day. So you see hearts on many of the pages in the upper two pictures. And then just yesterday, the same group came out and we made uh, little frames of, um, we call them nature windows, where the students were able to go out in the garden and collect petals and leaves and adhere them to these nature windows. Um, and they're able to display those back in school as a memory of kind of their time in the garden. We did this following directions and navigating the garden and making sure that they um, felt really comfortable with what they were engaging with in our space. And they seemed to have a great, I had a great time. Um, it was a really good day. Um, and then later this semester, we'll be making a mural with those students of um, iconic things they have seen here at the garden. So all of this um, leads me to like, how do you, how can you do this kind of work? So I think this is work that anybody can really do. It's, um, it has become intuitive for me, but it wasn't at first. So how do we encourage people to be good stewards of the natural world, engage with the natural world where they are? Here, I have some kind of prompts of scenarios that I think many of us who have worked in environmental centers, environmental education centers, or um, even just like public facing venues might have engaged. Um, so one could be a young couple that comes with their children. Um, and one of them often is the child that you see getting like what I call the side eye. Um, you might see this you know, at your local Target, but you are definitely going to see it if this kid is kind of running around or more difficult to wrangle. Or um, I've seen it quite a lot when I have a student who wears noise canceling headphones and they're in a crowd and they get a look from other other people. So how do you create a program that that whole family can engage with equally. Um, so that's one question and we'll, I'll kind of circle back to some of these. Another question is, um, which I get quite a bit, is the extent, the large extended family, um, you know, children in elementary and middle school, a couple of middle-aged adults, a couple of late, late teens or very early 20s that may be cousins, I don't know. And then some people who are slightly older in their mid, late 60s, early 70s, anything in that family seems to span from seven to 75 years old and energy to match that broad age span. And perhaps this family speaks a language other than English when they're in your facility or in your space, something that maybe you do or don't understand. And then there's this one that is near and dear to my heart because field trip season is fully upon us here at Duke Gardens. Um, you get a group, a school group of students from some nearby public school with chaperones and teachers who um, really look like they need the break. Um, they're just kind of done. But the, there's a couple of kids in that group who are like running around and um, playing sword fighting with their classmates using some rather sharp looking sticks. So how how do we incorporate these different learning styles and these different groups? Because they could all be happening at the same time. They could all be happening at different times, but we've all sort of engaged those groups in different ways, or at least encountered them in different ways. So again, all hypothetical scenarios, but these are all experiences that one or one of us might have encountered at some point. That young family with their kids, perhaps the child with the headphones has some sensory processing disorder, doesn't really enjoy loud noises. This is a way for them to be out with their family fully and engage without being overstimulated. But they're really tired of being the special needs family or they just want their two kids to engage in the same class at the same time, or they just want to go on a hike together. So how do we want to just engage them in a way that removes stigma? How do we provide programming that is sensory friendly? Maybe we advertise if there's really loud noises, or we let them know where there's a space that's quieter, or we just provide 
a statement ahead of our program that says our programs aim to be inclusive of everybody. Let us know if you have any accommodation needs. Um, I've had this where I have to teach so that the kid who has a sensory processing disorder who tends to stick everything in their mouth, um, we just have to know that or catch that ahead of time and make sure that what we're bringing is friendly for all sensory needs in the group. Um, I can point to a time where I was co-teaching a program in a space that was not my own. Um, I was just assisting with this program and the students were from um, the local school for the blind and they were like little second graders or so. Um, and they had a really great time. They were processing things tactilely and they were smelling things and it was a great program. Um, but as the program is wrapping up, the person who was leading the program turned to me and just with all the kindness in her heart was like, those poor parents, I can't imagine that life. And the uh, one of the parents overheard them. And that is not the way, like that was all very um, kind. And like, she had empathy in her heart when she said that, that's not what that family needed. They needed a space to feel normal and welcome and included. Um, so just remembering that the way we think about the program as being the space for everybody really makes a big difference to that family. Um, and, and pity is not the way to do these programming. It's genuine love for the outdoors and making sure everybody can engage that. Um, so those, that extended family group that I mentioned hypothetically, well, I love to be able to offer programming that includes multi-generational learning the youngest to the oldest in that family can both engage and learn in some way, whether that is a puzzle game or that is a tactile opportunity, um, opportunities for the older generation to teach what they learn and have learned over time with the younger kids. Um, and also important is to provide a space for gathering for families that are large. Oftentimes our nature spaces or picnic shelters are for um, picnic tables are made right now for a family of five, four, like if they're not big. So have a space where you can move tables and chairs around or they can gather, large families can gather and feel like they're all included and welcome. Um, and then multi-language opportunities are great if the resources are available. Um, and if they're not, um, I don't love Google Translate, but it has come up a great long way and it's better than um, not saying anything to that family at all. So trying to say welcome, trying to let them know where resources, like where the restrooms are, those are important things to be able to provide, even if you can't provide a program in all universal languages. And then um, the, the rowdy school kids, which we love, um, they just needs to be multi-sensory learning. That means opportunities to get that energy out, opportunities to engage in learning in a way that all kids can, can learn in their space. So maybe sword fighting isn't it. Maybe we, um, I, here at the garden, we have a lot of um, open space that we're blessed with. So sometimes between one stop and another, when we're doing a tour of the space, we have children flutter around like a butterfly between one flower and the next, or they um, pretend to be a hummingbird to get from one plant to a next or one spot to another. Surprisingly burns a lot of energy to be a butterfly and be a hummingbird. Um, there's ways that we can, you know, have the, the kids with the most energy lead the group to a next stop or lead and come back, or we want to use that, that energy for good. And, um, keep the swords on the ground until, until it's, the energy is gone. Um, but we don't, yeah, we want to encourage using energy rather than the sit and listen learning style. Um, so many of us have learned how to teach based on how we were taught. And this is one thing that I really hate. Um, and I try really hard to get away from it as I sit here and like talk at you. Um, <laughs> 
I I don't learn best that way, and many of us do not learn best that way. Um, in in the technology world, this is sometimes what we have at our disposal that's most readily available. But getting out outside what we learned and how we learned, and thinking outside that box, will really help us create programs that are universal for all learners that are able to meet the needs of these diverse communities and diverse audiences. And this goes back to remembering that not everybody looks and learns and sounds like me. Um, I was not the child who loved dinosaurs, but I know children love dinosaurs. So I get excited about dinosaurs as an adult in order to provide that engagement and provide that energy for them. Um, So teaching the way I was taught, remember, I hated school. I didn't want to be a teacher. I do not want to provide that to the students who I engage with and the learners who come to me. Um, I I really hope, I can't see anybody except Chris, but I'm hoping that no one looks like this bottom picture (laughs) Um, and that we're all at least a little bit engaged in some way. But um, the hope is when you're teaching in person, especially like you're able to get away from the slumped glazed over eyes like how exciting is it to engage the student who has looked like they're so bored and suddenly you see them like light bulb moment or a magic moment and things are exciting again Um, and that's one thing that we we like to do we don't reinvent the wheel but we certainly use things that are at our disposal Um, so one thing I've learned is When nature presents magical moments, you just like you grab them. And even if it's not on topic, um, for instance, I just saw two birds chasing each other like right over there. Um, And if I was here with kids, I'd be like, oh, let's what are they doing? Like what what is happening? Use nature, use the outdoors, use the space that you're in to explore. It could be those really sharp sticks. How do they get so sharp? Where did this come from? Well, how does it feel? Does it have a, does it smell in any way? Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't have to practice the things that you were taught, but um, seize those magical moments of, of nature and what they, what they throw at you. So uh, <laughs> path of least resistance. Um, they, there are really great um, things that are already out there. But we get caught up in this. Um, we, I'm just using the royal we as educators often get caught up doing what has been done before because it's there and it's readily available. Pull off a shelf and be like, here's the lesson we're doing today. And, um, when we get caught in that cycle, we forget to think outside the box and we forget to be innovative and we forget that, um, Perhaps you were taught this and it wasn't fun when you were taught it. If I had to teach chemistry today, it probably would be a really boring class because how I was taught chemistry was not very engaging. Um, But I could be like, oh, let me think of a new way to teach about pH or titrations or whatever is exciting about chemistry in a way that's a little bit different. So that path of least resistance isn't always the best option if you want to be a little bit more innovative or um, being able to incorporate learners of different kinds. So to invigorate our our listeners today or our visitors today, um, I have a challenge for everybody here. Whether you are an educator or a learner or at a space where educators might be, um, whether that's a teacher or um, environmental education center, museum, any any park, all of you, you can all do this. And even if you aren't a teacher or an informal educator, if you have access to people who like to learn, children or adults, um, I do this to my family all the time by accident, well, by training, I guess. Um, I teach my parents things. I teach my grandparents things. I, I teach my siblings things. They're all adults, but I get excited about a plant or an animal and we just... So my challenge for you all is change the way that you were taught as and not do that when you're teaching. So uh, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used to create them. We can't provide inclusive and engaging programming if we didn't learn to, to learn, like if we weren't being taught in a way that was inclusive and engaging to you. So 
my challenge to you is to break that cycle, break the path of least resistance, challenge yourself this year or this month or this week or even this afternoon to, or even challenge a colleague if you want to pass the challenge along, provide a program that includes and welcomes an audience that doesn't look or learn like you do. Um, This could be that you reach out to the local elementary school where they have an exceptional children's classroom and you offer to go read a story or to do an art project or um, anything that is like up your alley. Find a level that you're comfortable in, but challenge yourself to go teach someone who is who's learning differently and exploring the world in a way that isn't like you explore and learn in this world. Um, So I try to add a little bit of like personal touch to this presentation. (laughs) I did a lot at the beginning. Um, One thing that's invisible to most of you, and I'm always happy to talk about it because it provides a sense of understanding is I have a pretty profound hearing loss and I use hearing aids. And if I went to you and asked you to teach me something and I wasn't wearing those, how would you create a program that I could engage in? Um, So those are the questions that I ask people. And then go do it, right? Say you're going to go do this program or this like story time, whatever it is, and and go walk your talk. Um, I love this because I love birds and it's a great image. Um, I didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions, but I want to thank you all for your, hopefully for your attention today and for letting me be nerdy and energetic about removing barriers to nature. I um, will throw up my contact information in case anybody wants to reach out to me. I love to be an open door and a resource to you all if you have questions that you can't think of right now or that you would rather ask just in email, feel free to reach out to me. Chris, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Fantastic stuff. Absolutely nice. wonderful. Thank you, Liani, for being here. Yeah. yeah. And thanks for sharing so much of your story uh, and yeah. for providing so much like experience and insight yeah. Uh, yeah. for the presentation today. Uh, viewers, go ahead to start dropping your thoughts and comments into the chat as you download the presentation. Start uploading your comments into the chat. That way, for the time we have remaining, I can turn to you for the questions and answers. But maybe to kick it off, Liani, um, I'm curious about like what sorts of training or professional developments or learning opportunities there are for folks who are programmers or educators or who might be adjacent to those spaces even yeah uh to sort of get some skills like you mentioned sure. universal design principles mm-hmm. which are fantastic because it you know universal design does this thing of making yes. sure that just about everybody can participate yeah. from the get go you're not yeah. retrofitting you're right. making it good for everybody from the start mm-hmm. but you got to those don't necessarily come naturally to everyone right and there are training programs i don't know what do you think there are yeah so um there's a lot of resources. I mean, I thank the Office of Environmental Education here. Um, there's a lot of resources for just environmental education, period. And the work that I have seen the programs and the trainings undergo in the last even like five, ten years has been really great to be thoughtful about and being very inclusive. So those are some really good resources. Um, web- I mean, there's a lot on the website, but I would also offer... Um, Arts Access is in North Carolina, Central North Carolina, in Raleigh, um, and they provide a lot of training. It's very arts focused, but they provide training on things like how to be a sighted guide for people who are visually impaired to just enjoy your venue, um, audio description training, which can be really um, not just beneficial to you, but also beneficial to the arts community, people who want to go see a play or a symphony. You can describe that auditorily to them. Um, one thing I um, always suggest is try experiencing the world through that lens, um, not in a like, go to a park blindfolded, please don't do that. But be um, mindful of like, how would you navigate this space if you couldn't see it? or hear it or um, engage in it fully. Like if you had to use a wheelchair 
Um, I learned a lot personally, just spraining my ankle, like, where's the ramp? Where are the elevators? Which is not at all on par with somebody who has to use a wheelchair for mobility, but it does bring to mind where access points are, are key. Um, and then um, I like, I love going to like deaf chat groups. Um, there's coffee, deaf chat coffee, where people who are deaf will happily engage with you to learn sign language. Uh, so there's just a number of opportunities. The central North Carolina is ripe with great opportunities for many different audiences. Um, and then uh, social media has been really great. Like, uh, like the, the whole Super Bowl was like really had beautiful ASL interpreter. Right? So like accessibility is becoming a big, big thing. Um for architectural space and like physical North Carolina State University was like the founding place for universal design and architecture. Um, and then universal design for learning is has a really prevalent presence um, online. So I think those are really great places. Um, if you're focused on like a, the Americans with Disabilities Act, there's whole like series where you can learn about ADA building blocks and what it mean, what the ADA means and the foundations of that for just the physical space that you're in. Um, and they have a whole section on um, outdoor spaces as well. So those are a few resources. Thank you. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Some stuff that's come into the chat for you. Uh, let's see. The teacher ed folks here at the museum wanted to know if you had any suggestions for short, great tools to give teachers related to universal design uh, and was also commenting that teachers are chronically exhausted and spread thin yeah. uh, and that it can be difficult because they do have such hard jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to all of our teachers who are um, just rocking the, the field right now. And um, I see very small snippets of it through field trips. And I know they're um, not just spread thin, but doing incredible work with these students every day. Um, resources for universal design for learning. Again, there's like a really easy PDF that's downloadable from the universal design for learning website that um, provides a breakdown of like how a program or a, even a lesson plan should be designed universally. Um, it can be really overwhelming, especially when you're overworked to overhaul an entire lesson. So I, I always suggest with just like start with one thing, say, I'm gonna make this lesson have more sensory components. And that's your, your goal. So how do I add a tactile and auditory and uh, olfactory? I, generally don't add taste because that's a bad news bears with with kids um but yeah touch and sound and smell and sight and highlight um, multi-sensory learning is a really great way to provide universal design in a foundational way um that it feels achievable in many cases excellent stuff uh one of our viewers loved the maps of the state that you produced Mm -hmm. And wanted to know if there were ways to get copies of those or if they were online somewhere. They are not online. Uh, I can send you what I have made. Um, those are from 2018 data. So they're uh, five years old. Um, and the, the there's a newer census and a newer American Community Service data. I, um, I coded and programmed all of those in a statistics software. <laughs> oh, wow. Impressive. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, let's see. They can they can scrub backwards into the video and grab your email. Yeah, address. feel free. Yeah, grab my email, and um, I'm happy to send what I have, and I have for different demographics. Yeah. And then they can they can go learn R statistics and. Yeah, it's all in R. <laughs> I wondered. I guess mm -hmm. I guess correctly. Uh, let's see. Next one for you. Do you have ideas, Will wants to know, on how some of these principles can be applied to public or expo style events? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, um, I have helped with, especially with um, sighted, like um, vision impairments, vision loss and blindness for big festivals like Raleigh used to have SparkCon, which is here in Raleigh, um, where we used um, both sighted guides and like GPS waypoints to navigate people um, 
to the correct venues for people who are visually impaired using, I mean, like these magical computers we hold in our pockets are able to speak out loud to users. Um, technology has changed a lot since I've done that, but um, basically like leverage tech and leverage technology in a way that is useful for people who have different needs at large expos. Um, and I know the museum continues to do a great deal with big events, including like Bug Fest and um, Astronomy Days for Sighted Guide for um, auditory, like people who are deaf and hard of hearing. There's always interpreters. I've seen really great um, sign language interpretation at music festival. I mean, I don't go, I watch YouTube videos um, of like big music festivals and interpretation. So there's a great deal. Um, and I would, I don't want to like highlight one particular person or, or agency, but Chicago has a great accessibility kind of um, cohort. And so does New York City. So both of those have big arts communities. And then if you're doing big festivals, I would just reach out to them because they obviously do big festivals in those communities. Excellent stuff. Yeah. Viani, thank you again. Absolutely. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> It was great to hear from you and your presentation today. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully we'll hear more from you in the future. Yeah, anytime. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. We will be back here next week, Wednesday at noon, with another great presentation. You can find out the schedule of events at naturalsciences.org. Or you can head to eenorthcarolina.org, the Environmental Education Office website. You can see the schedule for this program and more that they offer, as well as sign up for the email newsletter to get updates about the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Get that YouTube link in your inbox every week. That way you can come and join us for great programs. I want to thank the folks at the Office of Environmental Education, the Digital Media Group here at the museum for hosting the live stream, and the Committee on Diversity and Inclusion within the Department of Environmental Quality for their support of today's program. And folks, we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.